Mr. Stanford, put your mind on your soul. Yo, half the story has never been told. Ladies, you got to demand what you want and what we want is respect, right? Yo, just sit up on the track, I don't necessarily have to feel that it rhymes. Freedom every time for the sisters. Check this. Watch this. Now here we go now. Listen, if I'm poo poo rule, I be the ruler like uh, slick brick. Uh, uh -huh. Get with this quick witted the D the square and shit. Papa got a brand new bag. Mama got a brand new jag. A go tag. I ain't no old hat. Nah, I represent not only in the kitchen, in the bedroom, but also in the boardroom. So give me more room. Deny my opportunity. You in jeopardy. Yo, yo, set me free. Don't hinder me. Let me be. I'm fighting for freedom. I got the heat in case you need them. Uh, straight soldier. Ain't nobody told ya. Hold up. Hello everybody, welcome to the Book Slam Extra. I'm your host Jules. It's lovely to see you again. I hope you have had a lovely week. Uh, my week has been um, chaotic, <laughs> uh, but interesting at the same time. Um, I do hope you have had a lovely week. Uh, welcome again to um, our weekly podcast where we discuss all things books and writing and authorship and anything else in between that um so my name is Jules and um I am an author of dark fantasy and I also delve into sword and sorcery and dungeons and dragons and fantasy general um I also do a little bit of science fantasy as well and um yeah I have some good fun with it but I also do children's fantasy as well um and so yeah I I enjoy it um I'm also a publisher as well and um the publishing companies didn't go we still got some really good authors and I'm really 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 proud to say um that the authors that we have signed I'm so looking forward to when their books come out they're just going to be amazing um and the people are just wonderful to work with they're just I couldn't ask for a better group of people to to have on board and in my team um and it feels very much like that that we're part of a big team together so um and I also run a discord as well which is set up specifically just for writers and authors um and also beta readers as well so if you're looking for a safe space that doesn't do all the normal daily gossip or the politics or religion issues or anything like that is purely based on writing and authorship um poets are also welcome to and um yeah it's just a really nice space we've got some really good active beta readers on there at the moment so if you're interested uh send me a message in the comments uh that's my dog not a ghost <laughs> he likes to interrupt my podcast um what else do I do? I also do this and uh, we're, we're starting to delve into trying to play around with the best time slot for this because getting people to attend is not always easy. So uh, we are looking forward to this Sunday, though, because this Sunday we actually have a podcast again, which is going to be live. Um, so come and join us for that as well. That'll be at eight o'clock GMT or 3 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time. Um, well, I think, well, I've I've bored you long enough with my own things. Let me introduce to you my lovely co-host. <laughs> Hello, friends. Hi, Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Wonderful, thank you. It's nice to be here today. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you again. Did you have a nice week? Yeah, it's been productive. I've been doing a lot of writing, so that's really good, you know. Yeah, you're, you're making me very jealous with the amount of writing that you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all right in time. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been rainy and snowy, and we've had we've had sort of crummy weather. So it's been perfect for being indoors and having a cup of tea and writing a little. So yeah, <laughs> that is perfect weather for writing. I must admit, when we get storms here, there's nothing better than having a nice cup of hot chocolate um, or a cup of tea, and yeah. Uh, yeah, just whizzing away on the keyboard, or just sitting here, just staring into nothing, and then just waiting for someone to walk in and go, "I thought you were doing work." <laughs> I am. I'm staring at a wall. It's but my brain's here. working. It's all up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it surely is. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. So I'm Adam Andrews Johnson. I've written this book, The Mantis Variant. It is a horror dystopian novel that takes place in the dark future. People have started evolving and other people have started hunting them down and people are dying and it's exciting. And uh, it's pretty terrible. It's pretty, it's pretty gruesome right off the bat. People keep telling me the first chapter is shocking and horrible and 
I'm excited about that. So yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I, that, and that's that's really interesting actually because that's what we're going to talk about today, isn't it? How far is too far to write blood, guts, yep. score, sex scenes, yep. and all that? Uh, yep. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that actually some authors have a limit and some readers have a limit as well. So it's course, about recognizing that. And yeah, yeah, what's right for our book? So we're going to have a little bit, little bit of a deep dive into that. Now we're doing some other exciting things as well. Did you want to tell everyone about the competition that we're running? Sure. Yeah, we're running a competition. Yes, it's it's a. <laughs> Thousand word short story and poetry competition where we are hoping everyone will submit something and they're all going to have a similar theme so that when we were when we release the finished published book, all the works will all be will all be related to each other. So the way we've set it up is we want everybody to write something a thousand words or less that involves these three elements, a magnifying glass a wolf and the outer rings of Saturn. And as I've said in, in every, every time we talk about this, we want you to use your creativity. We're celebrating creativity. We're celebrating creative writing. We want you to take those three things, a magnifying glass, a wolf, and the outer rings of Saturn and make them something. It can totally be exactly what they are, a real magnifying glass, a real wolf, and the real outer rings of Saturn. Or if you want them to be, like I've said, drinks on a cocktail menu, references in a space flight for a, a spaceship, something completely different that has nothing to do. Maybe, maybe you're referencing emotions in a poem using these things. We want these things, these three items together. Again, magnifying glass, wolf, outer rings of Saturn, all in each of these pieces. And the winners, the top um, uh, writing uh, we are going to have published in a compilation volume that when we release it, 15% of the sales of that volume are going to be donated to the Trevor Project, which is a nonprofit that focuses on suicide prevention, especially among LGBTQ plus youth. And so we love them, we support them, and uh, we've already made donations to them. And uh, yeah, it's $10 to enter the competition. There's the email. Please uh, submit your thousand words or less uh, of writing. And we are excited to to, to read your work. So uh, yeah, that's the competition. Ooh, it's our first one. Oh yeah, right, right. It's our first one. And the, the deadline is, is open. We don't have a deadline right now. We're just open submissions. We would love to get your writing and we will close it when we're ready. So yeah, yeah. Woo. Absolutely, yeah. And what I'm going to do, because I promised last week I was going to show the QR code and I actually forgot. <laughs> So oh, what right. I'm going to do is I, <laughs> I'm going to put the uh, the 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 uh, the image of one of the lovely posters that you designed up on the screen oh. with uh, oh no that's the background <laughs> I pressed the wrong one hang on here it comes, here it comes. Oh, so I'm not very good <laughs> I'm not very good at talking about one thing and then reading something else at the same time it, I'm like, <laughs> then my hand is so completely different it doesn't work very well uh, I'm just trying to find it oh there we go uh there we go so that can go for free. So you can see the QR code in the top right corner. Uh, you can just scan that on your phone and it will take you directly to the PayPal um, uh, account. Um, and so you don't have to worry about sort of logging in or anything like that. Um, and yeah, you can see our, our image there, magnifying glass, the outer rings of Saturn and a wolf. So we're very excited and very interested to, to read all the entries. And we've got some good ones so far, which is really cool. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to, to, to when that happens. And I'm really looking forward to the compilation book that comes out of that and making a whole load of published authors. It's just going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm genuinely looking forward to that as well. Um, and we have got a returning guest today, haven't we? Uh, I think we're supposed to have two, but but yes, definitely definitely one at least at least one. We yeah. definitely have one at the moment, um, so we'll invite him on in just a few minutes. Um, and so we're going to talk about um, how far is too far today. Now I know you've mentioned a little bit about what goes on in your books. Um, I I'm going to if if it depends on how much time we have, but I may I may read a little bit from here because there's a scene in here that um, is quite was really difficult for me to write and I'm still not sure if it went too far or not and so I'm really interested to hear what people think so yeah so um yeah if I you know I'm what if you start with that today pardon what if you start with that today <laughs> we Here's can do before yeah right before before we actually talk about it what if you read the scene to us and let us start the we discussion can do. From there. Should we, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, should we invite our lovely guest author on first? Certainly. Yeah, no, totally, absolutely. I didn't mean first. first but <laughs> no. Why don't, we, why don't we have you read soon? That'd be great. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. I thought we could invite our guest author on and we can, you know, he can obviously uh, re reintroduce him because his, his work is amazing. Um, and I've got some of his um, uh, oh, illustrations for his colours. Thank you. My brain went like that. That's it. Uh, <laughs> um and uh like i said it's been a bit of a chaotic week this week so my brain's a bit like uh, i'm not really thinking about it <laughs> um and so yeah and so we can show some of those because they're, they're amazing and obviously you know if you could send me the front cover for that and i can also share that too and we can do a little bit of a little bit of a showing off session tonight i think definitely worthwhile all right let's invite chris back on hang on a second here we go ready chris hi i'm all <laughs> black behind me because i'm a horror writer and i followed your discussion with, with lots of interest about how far is too far and mm. i told you a little bit about my how my trilogy ends and i finished the third book on sunday and I, can and I can tell you, it is super violent and it is super sexual. You can talk a little bit about it, but I also told you how it will get resolved. And this, this is, it's a bloodbath in the end. But there is, a very, there is a very lovely scene. And let me tell you, the devil gets a very nice send off. That's, oh, the, main thing. That's the main thing. Because she will be reunited with her true love and they're both up. Coyotes and they will walk off and they will be happy together. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and the book features a talking owl. Oh, make of this oh. what you will. There is a talking owl because my, my lead character, Dallas Story, she is always compared to Athena, the death of Athena, and Athena needs an owl. And we already see that the owl in the in the second book when we go to the magic castle and in the magic castle in los angeles there's the owl bar and we already talk about owls and about her gay brother who is really oh uh, the movie clash of titans harry hamlin oil that is his thing uh -huh. and uh, he says oh well, yeah you're athena and i get i get mark hamill and uh, not mark hamill i get uh, harry hamlin that's the actor's name but uh, yes and the earth gets destroyed and it's in the in the <laughs> end in the end, as I told you, I give you give away the end. So spoilers, sorry no, guys. No. Book is out in June, but in the end, <clears throat> it's a brother who who asks them the ultimate question: Do you think horns will be with my outfit because he will be the new devil because <laughs> mummy mummy walked off and his his sister will basically swim out into the universe where the earth was and then she will say, "Let there be light," and she will create the earth. And the whole time we were on the parallel Earth, and she will create our Earth. And she asked, she asked her brother the most important sentence in, in the whole series. And I think it's the best sentence I ever wrote. She asked him, because they're fighting not who is good and evil. They're both children of Satan, but they're fighting along philosophical, uh, philosophical difference. And in the end, she is the one who solves the philosophical difference, because she is Athena. And what is Athena? The god goddess of wisdom and war. And in the end, you have this is a contradiction. You have to solve this contradiction. In the end, she said, Well, the answer is love. And she asked her brother, What is a God called um, who has no compassion? What is a God called who has no compassion? The devil. And that, that will be his role. And her role will be the role of, of the loving God of the New Testament who creates the earth and forget the old man. <laughs> that is so cool. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I like that twist because. That's something that I kind of always thought while reading Lord of the Rings that like, what if Lord of the Rings, what if Middle Earth is the Earth that comes before our world? Exactly. exactly. That's, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, I love and that. Exactly. And, 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 and I will read a chapter from the second book today. And, and, and I always hear this about all creating worlds and, and creating worlds. What I did throughout the whole series is, and the, the chapter I will read, <clears throat> the houses are real. I looked at the blueprints. The restaurants that people go to are real. I looked at the menus. Everything is so real. It's hyper real. And then I can see little differences. And so we can ultimately say, wait a minute, this is not, this is all real, and, but this is wrong. Yeah, because we're <laughs> on the parallel earth. Yep, yep. 
I love that. That's really cool. I, I love books where it has a twist on um, law or like folklore um, mm. or historical things that have actually happened but it's got like a, a new fantasy type twist to it or a gothic type twist to it or something mm -hmm. like that i love that idea there, <laughs> there's something very very interesting <clears throat> maybe i should explain how i write books because uh, when i posted i said oh i finished my book and somebody said oh welcome happy that you finished your first talk i never write drafts because what i do is i pre-plan everything it's like hitchcock or, or spielberg because everything is already broken down that's the story every scene is, is, is defined and then I write, and writing is I listen to my characters, that's the plot. And then now <laughs> editing is the language part. But during the, the writing of the final part, I knew that these two would destroy the earth, but I didn't really have the motivation. And then my character, Lara Stroy, gave me the motivation. She said that basically, that after all this bloodshed, she said, well, basically, they, they killed their own bodies, they're immortals, so they're spirits, basically. And this, this is set up in the second book, that they can leave their bodies because they're immortals. And then <clears throat> she says, well, Let's leave the earth the way it is. Let, let us both leave. And he's still hugging on the idea he wants to be God. And he is defined by this idea he wants to bring order to the chaos. He is this type of God. He's the guy who says, well, basically, some need to be punished and some will be good. And she says, well, basically, no, I believe in the free floating chaos. And um, we can't agree on what we want to do. So we better both leave. And he says, he, he doesn't want to leave. And she says, well, then I won't leave. And you will fight me until we destroy the earth. And she remembers this episode from the Outer Limits, the original series. There's an amazing episode. Check it out. It's on one of the video platforms. It's called A Feasibility Study. And it's the best piece of television you will ever see. Because <laughs> it, it's basically a, a, a whole block of people gets, a, gets affected by aliens. So a whole suburb. Oh. And what the aliens want, they want to conduct a feasibility study if the people on Earth can be enslaved. They need workers. And how this gets resolved, and this is getting very dark now, is that the group of people decides, so basically, if we go to the will of the aliens, they will come for the whole Earth. And the way we will avoid this is by killing ourselves. Wow. And this is, this is what Adela says, well, basically, the Earth will rather want to die than live under cruel God. And that's why she stays, and that's why ultimately the Earth gets destroyed, because she knows... I have to make the decision. I can't ask the people because we already have destroyed Los Angeles. Now we're destroying California, basically. And uh, everything is going to pieces. But as long as I will stay, my brother will fight me. And this is the only way we can save the human race from enslavement under a cruel god. I, I love how you, you, <laughs> you pinpointed California. <laughs> oh. All the countries, me, all the states. Trust me, trust me, there is this. I already built this. I already in the first book, I already set up this this uh, sort of <clears throat> Scientology esque church. And of course, the showdown takes place in the celebrity center of this church called the Tranquility Institute. And wouldn't you know, there are some rather famous people who get possessed by devils. <laughs> Not too far long away from true life, then, in some ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's really cool. I love that. That that that's a really cool twist. See, well, I I feel like your both of your writing is going to be a lot more graphic than mine. Mine yeah. is yeah. more. Yeah. I need to have a I need to have a little trigger warning for the, the the passage I want to read to you today. It's from the second book, and the second book sets up an interesting character, a young actress called Ellen Callaway. And we meet her in the 50s, and she's very young. This is very much modeled on, on young actresses. You know, this is a little bit graphic, but there's a, there's a twist in the end, as you will see. And um, she, will, she learns, she wants to change something about her life. She's this very famous, very young actress. A lot of examples come to mind, Judy Garland. A lot of these come to mind. And in the end, <clears throat> she uh, go through a lot of chapters where she builds a little empire, and she gets to marry Walt Disney my version of Disney. <laughs> and the theme park they built is her shrine because ultimately what she learns is that she needs to sacrifice something. And what she needs to sacrifice to achieve her goals, because as we will hear in the chapter I will read, um, her girlfriend tells her you need to sacrifice something. And what she needs to sacrifice is the idea that she is human because ultimately she is not human. She has to sacrifice this. This role of an actress is all an act because what she is is the Leviathan. She is the sister of the devil. But she doesn't know that? 
Or she, she, has to think. she has to she has she has suppressed that and when you go into the first part of the first chapter the chapter i will read there's all references to sea creatures and uh, she has somehow forgotten that she is a god and she has to she has clung to this idea of you of a human and there is a very uh heroine scene in the book where the um where a very famous actor with a dimple on his chin tries to sexually assault her this is actually built on the true assault of natalie wood and what she thinks of is this, 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 this dimple is like a black mirror. And she imagines three people standing around a swimming pool and they look at her. And what she ultimately realizes is that these three men who look at her, we meet all three men in the part I'm going to read, that these men are not looking at her lustfully, but they are afraid of her. And in this dimple, in this black mirror, she sees her true face. And that's the moment she realizes I'm wearing a flesh mask. I'm a god, and I'm, so, I'm supposed to rule. Mm. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as you see in the main plot of the of second book is that she, even though she died, supposedly, 20 years earlier, in the 70s, she haunts our weak character, that is Troy. And um, ultimately, we'll find out that um, the Leviathan, the devil, have something. They have a little thing going on. They have a little battle, and Adelis is caught in the middle. Now, Chris, because these you, two sisters don't no, like each other. Yes, Jules. No, I, I was just thinking. Did you want to read first? As you're, you're obviously you're going to lot. I could, I could, if you want me to, I could. Oh, well, been, I? The drill. Which book so, are you going to yeah. read from, and what color is it? Read, I'm going to read from the red book, The Neon Devil, the which is on sale book. today on two ninety nine. You get the first book for free, The Neon this Graveyard. One? You get the second one, this one. You get this for free. Uh, not for free, you get this for $2.99 and the first one for free on Amazon as a Kindle book. Right. And uh, this is um, um, this cover was designed by uh, Terry Osterhout. And this is a uh, point on the cover, and the design of the cover was Dave Elliott. So I just wanted to give a shout out to my collaborators. And the chapter I'm going to read from or was already pre published on Comic Crusaders, the website um, I write for, I used to write for. And um, some people might already have read it there. But it's the chapter that introduces us to this lovely young actress who doesn't know that she is the Leviathan. Not yet. Shall I start? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to remove myself and Adam from the stream, so it'll just be you. I'm going to try and yes. do it let's so you've got there as well. Go on, yeah. Adam. Sorry. Let's, let's remind everybody listening that, uh, that since we're talking about uh, taking things... Yes. Thank you, Adam. Things, Let's, let's just remind everybody that we're going to be reading probably some intense stuff today. So just yes, a yes. Warning. trigger warning, trigger warning. I have put, yeah, I've put a trigger warning out on the messages as well. So <laughs> obviously if you've got younger viewers or if you feel that there's going to be content that might be upsetting, watch something that makes you happy. Turn over. You don't <laughs> and, have and, to also, and also, also, I wrote this in my, 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 my um, disclaimer at the beginning of the book. If you are not in the headspace for this kind of material, please turn out for half, half an hour or so. Yeah. And also, I will, will be discussing religious themes. Remember, this is a story. This is all fiction. This has nothing to do with your face. This is all, these are space gods. They are not really religious gods. This is fiction. Yeah, Just that's it. That's it. Out there. it the whole show is fiction. So what we're, we're reading and describing is all just fiction. Um, However, it may be upsetting to some people. So, yeah, turn turn over and watch something that's going to make you feel happy. That's the most important thing. Be kind to yourself. <laughs> possibly sexual content warnings, possibly violent content warning. Yeah, Religious yeah, themes, sexual themes. And to give you an idea, this is chapter 10, and it's called Babylon Hollywood. It's a play on Hollywood Babylon, the Kenneth Engel book. And mm -hmm. we, are in 19, we begin the story in 1951, because my chapters always have a place that is... A title, a real place, and a time. And we begin in 19, 1951. And the houses we go to, they are real. They exist. Alan Callaway, I want you to come down here this very wait, minute. Wait, just, before you start, we're going we're gonna to take ourselves off the screen. Tell everybody your name one more time. Tell them the okay. name of the book and where they can get it. And then, and then jump in. And then Adam soon, is the prof professional here. I'm so invested in no, my no, story. No, no, no. Sure. Get the marketing now. Okay. <laughs> and, when you, and when you're done, just let us know, and we'll pop back onto the screen again. Yeah. Okay. Right. And what, what you can do, Chris, is when one of us is reading, um, you can uh, just put it into the private chat 
the, the links mm -hmm. and stuff and um, well, can, you can, I can, I'm not I'm not um, um, being, I'm not uh, signed up for the chat can you put in the Amazon link to the box can you just grab yeah, it yeah, and put yeah. it in there yeah I can put the whole lot in so if you just tuck, chuck it into once you finish reading um, chuck it into the, the private chat and I'll, I'll put it up right, hang, on. I drop, hang on let me do this first and I'll put this out of the way and just do this on my <laughs> Marketing is important, and I had some very interesting experiences today marketing my books, but that's a story for some other time. <laughs> that's uh, true, I'd love to hear though. <laughs> that's really intriguing. I will, tell you later. I will tell you later. Wonderful people. Okay, <laughs> but hang on. I just uh, drop it in the, the chat to Adam. Is that okay? Sure. That's that's that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, hang on. Just give me this. Right. Give me that. And, and then we'll pop it up on the screen. Sesame open. Thank you. And here you go. <laughs> See, I'm talking to myself. That's a right. Oh, no, no. That, that people do. Don't worry. <laughs> I have the best arguments. I always win. <laughs> okay. So that's the link, Adam. That's the link. That, that links to both books. Got and it. just, thank you. And just a quick reminder the third book is written, it's being edited, it drops in June. And I can now reveal the exclusive title because I originally decided or wanted the book to call uh, to be called The Neon Gods. But there is a book, a very popular book that is called Neon Gods. And I don't want to be accused of suing on their success. And so now we are going to call the book The Neon Children, which is a much better title, I think. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm going to, yep. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'll stick it up on the screen in just a moment. Um, and we're going to hand it over to you. Okay. Uh, Don't be confused. I'm turning to one side like I did the last time because I have this on my other screen and I don't like paper and my eyes are not so good. So I'm reading from the, from another screen. Don't be surprised. I'm not <laughs> getting whiplashed here. I'm just turning to the other screen. It's just You're fine. what I do. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I'll pop your cover, covers up um, sporadically throughout as well. All right, off you go. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, dear audience, you have been warned. You're going to hear a little bit about a character called Alan Holloway. Alan Holloway. I want you to come down here this very, mini, very minute. My God shouted at the top of the lungs, standing in the foyer of the European-style 19th century country house. Even though her bedroom was on the, on the other side of the residence and she had closed the door, she heard every word the woman yelled. I'm not ready, Anne screamed back, raising a voice that caused men to get a hard on, smiling at the most beautiful creature she'd ever seen. And don't tell me you're going to kill my cat. I don't have a fucking cat. No, she didn't. But it was the year of the cat. It most definitely was. In half a year, it would be the year of the dragon, the year of the water dragon, to put a final point on it. In her mind, there wasn't much difference between these species. The one wasn't real, and Chinese dra dragons didn't look like those mystical beasts you encountered in fairy tales. Her life was that. Like with the legendary Hydra or some other fabulous water snake-like monster from ancient lore, it was a make-believe story carefully crafted by her publicists at the studio feeding lines to Hella Hopper. She was a princess who lived in she was a princess who lived in one of the castles you saw around town, mansions made to resemble the Babylonian temples, Moroccan forts, Persian palaces, and the stately pleasure dome decree. There was no sacred river out, alas. The Los Angeles River ran dry nine months of the year. In this time, the structures, even the houses they resided in, were that painted backdrops on a movie back, studio backlot. Even the palm trees were set dressing. The full French country house they'd been living in for five years was quite all right. The cat might like the open spaces. She was a goddess, however. I don't care if you're ready, Ellen heard her mother holler, rudely interrupting her contemplations. Do you want Mr. Mayor to see me in my birthday suit? That'll get my contract re upped. Don't be cute with me, Alan, and don't tell me you aren't dressed yet. That is exactly what I'm trying to tell you, Mother, if, if only you'd listen. What's the rush anyway? They're going to Santa Monica, you know that. Being late isn't, isn't neither ladylike nor fashionable. Don't be ridiculous. 
And don't worry, there will be plenty of food left by the time we arrive, if we ever arrive. One minute, I'm going to send Red after you so he can carry you over his shoulder. You wouldn't dare, mother, I'm practically naked. Don't lie to me, Alan, I know you're dressed. Without lipstick, I aim, she shouted back louder, getting even more irritable than she already was, especially since her mother was correct. She was wearing a breathtakingly beautiful second gown MGM star custom designer Ellen Rose had made, made for her. Though the dress and the precarious silver shoes she had put on weren't reflective, reflective of her age or appropriate. Her shiny black hair matched her attire with how it bounced in sleek, luxurious waves over her bare shoulders and back. She had also lied about her lipstick. Being dragged to a party she had no interest in going to in the first place, she was still intent on leaving a lasting impression. She might even kiss a mirror in one of the bathrooms to give the filthy men something to dream about. Well, her Helena Rubinstein number six crimson red lipstick was perfect for that. As for the most beautiful creature she was picking at, wouldn't that be her marriage ring? Okay, I'm sending that after you, Marigold, yelled, whose name meant golden flowers. Quite puzzling, considering the woman had the most annoying voice, especially when she got loud. How am I supposed to apply my lipstick when you keep screaming like that? Sweet baby Jesus. Darting her eyes away from a face that was kissed by the gods, she smilingly gazed at the reflection of the framed black and white photography that hung on the opposite wall above the bed. What it was was an enlarged still from a, from, a, from a favorite movie, The Black Cat. The film itself was a bit of a stylish mess, with plenty of bizarre kings snuck into it such as necrophilia, incest, torture, and satanism, which wasn't that surprising since the film was directed by Edgar G. Almer, an Austin pervert who was into all kinds of weird shit. What made the picture such, such, such a standard, of course, Daddy Boris Karloff, who was such a boss in the 1930 horror film that teamed him up with Bela Lugosi for the first time. Even though the Hungarian Dracula actor fancied himself hot shit when it came to the ladies, giving his green rival dating tips when they appeared on a radio program together, Karloff was a real daddy. Gazing back at her with his sunken, black socket eyes, sporting a widow peak to end all widow peaks, and a scolding scowl that made you dizzy, Karloff was every girl's dream boat. Well, in her estimate, he was. Indeed, the actor had signed the picture for her, and being in his presence, even nearly two decades after completing his ugly best film, had made her go weak in her knees. She wanted to fuck Carlo so badly. She smiled at him and then at her face, pleased by what she saw. Turning away from the full-length mirror, she made sure to blow his image a kiss before she stepped out of her room and into the corridor. Alas, she blesses us with her presence, Marigold said, spotting her ambling from the living room. I'm ready for my close-up, she declared, as she finally made it into the lobby, sauntering, not striding still swatting her stuff, which the long gown she wore made easy. Smiling, Anne directed her gaze to the beefy man, then to her mother, who hadn't donned the thick glasses she usually put on when doing the books and financial records, or whatever she did when, nego or when negotiating on her behalf. Of course, Marigold hadn't. You're supposed to say action, she told, she told Red, flashing him an alluring crimson red lipstick smile. Action, the tall man said tipping two fingers against the short-sized brim of his great fedora hat. He had never made a move, being too smart for that. Even though Marigold controlled the purse strings and she signed his weekly checks, Red had, no zero, had zero trouble identifying the household's breadwinner. She'd been that since she was eight. Sneaking across the hardwood floor, she cast a famous lavender-colored eyes about the foyer. The hideous antique table she saw, the tufted sofas in the living room, the Charles and Ray Eames designed DC chairs in the dining room, and the other pieces of furniture in the house her parents considered an investment. Her movie star money had paid for all of it. The east facing 3200 square foot hillside country house, which sat on a three acre lot together with a 2000 square foot farm style guest cottage, the stone fireplace, the beamed ceilings, the paint windows, and even the fucking outdoor swimming pool, all, all of which were a soundstage and, and film set props, 
or be rented since this was California and nobody had any rules. It depended on her knowing her silly lines, smiling innocently into a camera, looking pretty and playing nice. Greg knew it, Marigold knew it, and that was right tonight. She and her mother were going to this fucking party to show the men at the studio that she was worth their time and valuable enough to have a seven year contract renewed, which ended in nine months. Drive, Marigold said. Helen slumped back in her seat, carefully avoiding creases in her evening gown. One of the windows in the wheel was open and she enjoyed the cool air that was by. It was July and the temperature during the daytime stayed above 100 degrees. Driving along Benedict Canyon and Beverly Crest, Ellen Smith smelled the heavily fragrant scent of the thick pines and the flowing cherry trees. Without leaning forward, she gazed at the man in the driving seat, driver's seat, who kept his eyes on the road ahead but was still seeing her. How could he not? She was the girl the studio paid a weekly salary of $850. According to the deal he and Marigold had struck when he began working for them two years ago, Red made $60 a week for the services he provided, plus free room and board, liquor not included. Red, whose full name was Redick Thorne, had managed to fit several careers into the relative short, short span of 30, 34 years he had roamed as motor coil. Having dropped out of college during his junior year for lack of funds, he immediately began competing in amateur boxing matches, turning pro during the year before he enlisted in Uncle Sam's army, where he continued his chosen paths. However, obtaining an honorable discharge after the war, he tried his hand at acting, moving out to Hollywood. Red landed a few minor roles and cheaply produced B pictures, which in turn led him being led to him being cast as the male lead in one of the better crime dramas of the era, the beautifully nihilistic comedy influenced detour, helmed by none other than Edward G. Almer. But movie stardom kept eluding him, thus Red returned to the ring, a washed up boxer at 29. It wouldn't last, and Red, in, Red fell in with the wrong crowd, or depending on your perspective, the right side, or maybe actually a bit of both since he first worked as a gang and enforcer, then as a private eye. He then was brought on to MGM by one of Louis B. Mayer's lieutenants as a fixer, which was also where he met Marigold, who had asked the studio if it was okay if she hired him away from them as a driver and bodyguard for her, for her and her star child. Since guys like Red, men with cold eyes, rough new rough faces, military issue crew cuts and broad shoulders were, done, were a dime a dozen, the studio didn't object, especially not since she had just started in her most successful film to date, which had made $6.5 million at the worldwide box office on a budget of less than 250000 Looking at the men's huge hands on the wheel, she figured once again that his name was interesting. The meaning in Latin was rude. As far as the Slavic origin went, it meant fortune, eager or lucky. In German, red was the word used for wheel which kind of made him a wheel of fortune. Well, in her mind, it did anyway. And no surprise then that he should, up and should end up as a driver. As, as for the other part of his job description, she did just fine fending for herself, if need be. But it was comforting to know that he waited in the car room and that she was seeing someone outside the studio lot. Like with that guy who had invited her to his Laurel Canyon mansion, allegedly to discuss the character she was playing, to develop the script, or what other lame ass excuse his one-track mind had managed to pull out of his sorry ass. It happened early in the week, and when she showed up on his doorstep, she already got the sense that this wouldn't end well. For one, the man, a director in his early 50s, had a Greek name she found impossible to ever pronounce correctly, not that she cared. But the former, and the fact that he wanted to meet her meet her at his house, made her raise an eyebrow. She only played the little dumb bitch in the movies. He had to know that. After some polite conversation and a bit of shop talk, both intended as a pretext to whatever he had, he had in mind, with her being able to see in his beady big wolf eyes how the gears in his head clicked into place, he told her he wanted to show her something. And what, what he presented to her was shocking, albeit not surprising if you paid attention to the blind items in Los Angeles Times. The windowless room she was let in by the foreign director was soundproof for good reasons. By all appearance, he had a dungeon installed right next to his fucking living room and home office. 
Judging by the torture equipment, her violent eyes spied, the old pervert was really into, really into what was called BDSM. I want to tie you up, the swan pig announced, breaking into a sweat as he pointed to an X-shaped metal cross that was fixed to a frame in the floor and featured leather straps to restrain an individual in a spread eagle position. I'm going to fuck your tight little pussy until you come so hard you faint, he added with a sickle grin on his olives, oily olive skin, the corners of his spittle wet lips twitching uncontrollably. Peering at the metal cross, she concluded that it looked interesting, darkly fascinating even. That was until you noticed the gross man standing next to it, leering at her. Since she read a lot, she was an actress after all, and in between takes there was nothing else to do on a set other than that to fuck or get shit-faced, she knew it was called the St. Andrew's Cross, named for, Saint An for Andrew the Apostle, who, like his brother Simon Peter, was a disciple of Christ and a fisher of men. However, when coming to the Greek city of Petras in AD 60, people didn't take well to his patron. Willing to die for his faith, Andrew allowed himself to get arrested and bound, not nailed, to what was known as the Latin cross, the kind Jesus was nailed to by the Romans. The legend changed, changed in subsequent retellings, identifying the cross as a Tracticasta, also known as a Saltillo or an X-shaped cross. Supposedly, Andrew had requested this contraption to be used as the instrument of his execution, lest he put himself on one level with Jesus, deeming, deeming his sorry self unworthy of the crucifixion on the Latin cross. It was either this, or Andrew, declared a saint for sacrifice, was into some kinky shit. Curiously gazing at the restraining points for wrist, ankles, and waist on the sex object as tall as she, she could see that. She was sure there were pleasures to be had from being tied to this plaything. Only the fat, ugly Helmish was not the partner she wanted to try this out with. She was more into girls right now anyway. You like that, don't you? The man with the unpronounceable name deduced by his eyes fixed her attire. I want you to take off all your clothes, he told her as he began to pull down his pants. You know, my mother has, has put me on a strict diet, which means I'm always hungry. If I put that in my mouth, who knows what's going to happen? I might shoot it off clean and swallow it whole in one bite. This pitiful member got flaccid, fast following her candid proclamation, especially with how she flashed her pearly whites at him. He could tell that she had strong jaw muscles and that she was a hungry girl. Flustered, he pulled, he pulled up his seersucker pants in no time flat as she saw herself out. Striding to the car, idling at the curb in front of the mansion, she never mentioned the incident to Red, who sat behind the steering wheel. But when he shot her a glance in the rear mirror, she was convinced he knew. Red stopping the car was what pulled her out of her reverie. They were at six, 625 Palisades Beach Road, Santa Monica. The gaudily lit white house with the brown shingle roof she spied was right at the water. The light from inside the house and the terracotta tiled terrace imbued the indigo blue water of the Pacific and the beach with a golden sheen. It was already past 10 p.m. and though there were no stars up in the night sky, no moon competed with the techy illumination of the beach house. As for the stars she beheld above her when Red got the door for her and her mother and she got out of the blue Lincoln cosmopolitan limousine, a case could be made that they shone less brightly than those signed to MGM, and it wouldn't even have been a lie. I want you on your best behavior, her muscle whispered to her as, she, as they approached the house. She nodded in agreement while her eyes followed the car. Red wasn't leaving, he was simply moving the vehicle, so when the next party guest arrived, they had the stage to themselves. She knew he'd be waiting at the parking area behind the 6,416 square foot abode designed for the fancy rides of the stars. It was also where the drivers hung out, passing around a flask of cheap bourbon or scotch or whatever their poison was, awaiting the return of the employee employers, most likely intoxicated themselves by the time they emerged from the oceanfront domicile, thus unable to notice any liquor stench on their driver's breath in the inebriate state. Only that didn't drink, at least not in public. Instead, he usually brought one of the paperback novels he was fond of reading, books with lovingly painted and tightly covers. 
you look like a million dollars, Ellen heard her mother say once they had reached the swimming pool. The water looked green as it reflected the lights from the dinner seal. Then, casting her violin gaze upward, she spied three broad iron balconies appearing glaringly white. Don't worry, they are going to renew my contract, and I will continue to shit money for us, she said, thinking of the 13 onyx bathrooms of the magic castle she had heard so much about. She might leave something else in there other than a crimson lipstick kiss. However, that would have been unfair since the studio boss no longer resided in the Pleasure Dome, he had decreed in 1936, erected within six weeks, utilizing electricians, artisans, carpenters from MGM's backlot. Balding Kubla Khan had, been, had even tasked art director Cedric Gibson with giving the beachside property a Mediterranean, olive tree rich flair. Don't talk like that, Mary Gold admonished her, feigning the na naive West Midwesterner she never was. She had been around the block a couple of times since her divorce. Ellen hardly remembered her father. Don't worry, I'll play your little girl, Mary Gold. I'm an actress. I'll even pretend I'm still innocent. You cannot shock me, Ellen. But yes, go right ahead and do that. We need that contract. Yeah, no, she assured her mother, glancing at the front door and the high panoramic windows left and right from it, loathing the people she spotted in the large living room on the ground floor. LB, we are so glad you finally made it, Marigold purred after adding with a sigh. Traffic on the P PCH is a nightmare. Why in the world do so many people own cars who don't know how to drive? She had to hand it to Marigold. She was one of the few people who called the studio model LB. But even more amazing was her ability to switch from being a tough bitch in business affairs to a pussycat mode in under 10 seconds. The men in the movie making colony considered her old at 43, and they made her feel fat. Which she wasn't. Yes, a bit bloated, sure. But she knew how to turn on the charm like a cat's headlights, like a car's headlights. Though, the head, though, her, though her headlights, were a long time away from getting much, much attention. Marigold, Marigold, I'm glad you made it safe, the real thin gray haired man with the horn and specs. He had a doe like face, like a, he had the doe like face of a bulldog. In her silver high heels, she towered over him. Louis B. Mayer was a tyrant and a major asshole, but he was also a smart businessman. She was his investment. Having to deal with her, with her stage mother was simply the cost of doing business. Ellen knew Mayer hated her mother, or any mother for that matter, who was protecting her child from men like him. The way he glanced at Marigold gave it away. There was so much hate in those eyes magnified by his hideous glasses. He expected she'd be soon distracted by craft services. Being a prick and an old miser, he had hired the catering crew who worked for the studio. And lest his valuable two-legged racehorses got fat, the menu consisted exclusively of fresh seafood tonight. Unlike Marigold, she had no laugh for the buffet set up on, a side, in, on sideboards arranged into a cross as if they were supposed to pray to the Catholic Legion of Decency. And we'll, be glad, and we'll be glad once you find once, once you find the time to talk about the new contract, she heard Marigold say to the disgusting man. It was impossible not to notice how his x ray eyes were pinned to a secret dress. The contract he wanted to include a substantial raise, but all in due time, just be patient. As long as you remember that my girl is worth every red cent, just look at her, will you? That silver screen goddess material right there, her mother concluded her pitch while she slowly drifted away. Well, she did wear a silver dress. As for the goddess part, the Swami actor making a beeline for the prettiest girl in the room seemed to think that she was that. Before he even spoke, she shot him a gaze, telling him she was Athena having sprung, from, sprung forth from Zeus' head, a 14-year-old son's any intention of polishing his tiny Johnson. Darting her violent eyes to the platinum blonde starlet, involved in a serious discussion with two directors while failing, falling out of her dress, she was seized in like a dagger, she silently told, told him, go, fuck brother Peyton. While she wondered at the same time what in the world the would be actress was telling these filmmakers who politely laughed at her anecdotes. They wanted different from, the, from a 13 year old boy jerking off to the recent pinup photo, the one depicting the hot blonde in a metallic red two piece swimsuit. 
Lounging seductively at the edge of a swimming pool, she made the most of her body in her long legs, though the mansion in the background was only superimposed into the shot. Rumor had it she was fucking the Pope, though all she ever craved was a big black cock. Having disentangled herself from a suitor, she stepped to one of the windows to look at the roaring ocean ripping at the sand. What creature might be born in its black depths, she wondered, squinting, the bo squinting at the bobbing, frothing waves, ignoring the million muscle eyes checking out her ass, which was probably for the better. It was one of those nights when she missed her father. She did eventually make it to the buffet, which was where the, another guy chatted her up. You're Alan Calloway, right? The man deduced, not the most original way to get her attention. Holding the plate in one hand, he still had a hand at his disposal to brush back the long strands of thick brown hair that were grazing the temples of his lean face. Only he didn't do that. Maybe it was supposed to be charming, only it wasn't. He seriously needed to come. Plus, he was at least 20 years older. People keep calling me that, keep calling me by that name, and I respond, so I guess it must be true. And Joseph Bell, the Mastoshia guy, introduced himself as if she didn't know he, who he was. People call me Uncle Joe, he added, in his soothing, deadly dull, southern drawl that made him sound retarded. I'm not going to call you that, she told the man, who had crooked teeth and a long, thin nose, as she reached for a silver spoon to add two deviled eggs to the citrus shrimp and avocado salad. Why not, he wondered, as he helped himself to a healthy serving of shrimp curry mothers. Because I'm 14 and you're a grown as man, and it sounds fucking creepy, she whispered. I see. Little children love calling me that. They love my rabbit, he said, shrugging his shoulders. Now here my take, this is a double entendre, but sadly, I can tell you a serious. I am. Stucky the lucky rabbit is a star, he asserted, awkwardly flashing his uneven teeth at her. You're just weird. What are you doing here anyway? You're not MGM. Are you trying to get late? She isn't MGM either, he posited, darting a glance at the smoking hot blonde, and neither is the guy she is with. They don't look like they are in the business at all. That's Kitty Jehovah, as you probably know. Her dad can buy her studio for a birthday, no sweat. I know. Mr. Meyer and, and we are in negotiations for a joint project, he revealed. Great. That's what we need. More horny rabbits and carved the gates to her plate. I'm into nibbling on X, but even though it's the year of the rabbit, I'm not into rabbit meat, she stated, striding away, sensing his eyes burning holes into her dress that accented her, accented her S thanks to the talent of Mrs. Rose. Wow, she's something else, her Ellen heard the nerdy, bespectacled guy, guy say, who was standing next to the uninspired heck who had come up with one good idea, who otherwise relied on his legion of gifted animators to haul his ass out of the fire that was, that was bankruptcy. After a string of hits in the 40s, Bell wasn't doing so hot. There was even a rumor going around that Bell's business partner was trying to sell the fading studio. And maybe that was why those men were here tonight. Only for now, Stuart Saki Siegel, the man for whom Bell had named his lucky creation, was busy staring at the buttons. The oily haired round specs wearing men in the bespoke suit and the gaze he darted at her from the other end of the room was something else entirely. Standing prone, Alan shot him a smile and tended to make his wood hard, though his wife, artist Miriam Sweat, was watching him like a hawk. At 46, he was, half, he was a halfway decent playwright and a one-time director. However, what was most puzzling, the money man in New York had forced LB to bring him on as the next Irving Kroger. As much as Maya was one, of, one, one hell of a shrewd uh, numbers guy, MGM was losing ground fast with, ever -changing with the ever-changing taste of movie goals. Luring Gori Shari away from RPO, making him head of production, was one big Hail Mary to reverse the fortunes of the studio. At least that was, at least it was that for MGM's parent company. Glancing at him, Alan could tell he was a schwag swimming, swimming with the goopies. In 1994, LB had lost his house in the divorce settlement, although his, his ex-wife Margaret let him use the property on occasion after May had moved into a, a suite at the Roswell Hotel. Now, this man was gunning for his job. She almost felt sorry for the sexist pig. And I was sitting in, her arm in the armchair she used for her desk, though she had turned the chair to face her bed with her bare feet propped on the heavy mattress. 
Smoking a cigarette, she cast her gaze away from Doris Carlos' stern scowl to her legs. She was wearing faded blue jeans that were too long. Hence, she had rolled up the cuffs, which was peculiar, she thought, since everybody kept telling her that she had these most amazing legs. Well, her legs weren't as long as Barbara Payton's, but her 15th birthday party was only a week ago. She had requested her party to be a low-key affair. Surprisingly, her mother had relented. And then, but then she could sense it too. Hollywood was changing. Was, was, Hollywood was changing. Nasi in August, less than a month after the party at the oceanfront property he no longer owned, Louis B. Mayer was unceremoniously fired from the studio that run for almost three decades with a tight fist in his wandering eyes. As she had predicted, greasy haired Dori Shari succeeded Mayer at the helm, but the writing was on the wall. Following a landmark United States Supreme Court ruling that barred studios from operating, from operating proper, proprietary theaters, Lowe's Inc., MGM's overlords, decided to divest its controlling stake in Nickel of the Nice Studios Inc. He was in a ironic movie twist for you. Being the parent of one of the largest chains of movie theaters in the country, namely Lowe's Theaters, Lowe's chose to retain its lucrative distribution ex and exhibition business rather than keep churning out content. Meanwhile, Dori Shari believed that that even more leveraged cinema scope productions filmed in Technicolor were the antidote against their new enemy, a black and white eye that was television. She had heard that Bell was interested in the new medium, but with a studio that once was the last to embrace sound pictures and with Maya gone, whatever deal the awkward gone man had envisioned to save his little shingle was dead in the water. Sherry had no interest in television, and as was evident from the studio's new production slate, but Maya, he was not. If you wanted further evidence that the tightly controlled star system had overstayed its welcome and that the public was eager to see Rome Babylon go up in flames, there was a new scandal wreck rumored to be waiting in the wings to blow, off the lid, to blow the lid off. Hollywood began to look like the day of the locusts had arrived, only that the little men who were dead inside and would come to Hollywood to die were turning on, were turning on Tinseltown to shabbily witness the burning of Los Angeles first hand if not lighting the fuse themselves. To get a taste of how much things were destined to become hinged, uncensored and off the record, you only had to take a look at the shit show that was the disappearance of Kitty Jehovah. Just a week ago, just a week after the daughter of the richest man in America had turned up at Margaret's beachside mansion, Kitty had vanished one night while driving in a silver Mercedes car, sports car on route 1 on 10. Not only was Kitty wealthy, but she gave Barbara Payton a run for her, for her money in the looks department. Naturally, the press was all over the case, and though the small army of reporters working the story didn't bury the lead with their wild speculations that she had been either abducted by aliens and their flying sources, Satanists, or a pack of inbred perverts, they didn't shy away from pointing the finger at the degenerates you encountered in the cesspool of depravity and sinfulness that was Hollywood. Sensing that Mr. and Mrs. Midwest Bible World had in its head an insatiable appetite for sordid tales of moral downfall. For every kitty, there was another star with the stars in her eyes. She might be next too, and there wouldn't be much of a studio system left to protect her from the vultures. So far, she was still everybody's darling, and she knew what MGM's press release would say tomorrow. Today was Wednesday, April 30th, 1952, and it was an important day for Mary Dalton Perham. This morning, they and the new head of MGM had signed a new seven-year contract, and she didn't even have to fuck Dory Shari for it. However, the oily fist execut executive had steadfastly refused to make good on the race. Maya tentatively agreed on to put a stop to Mary God's badgering. Citing financial pressures from his corporate puppet masters, he had assured them that she was still an MGM's princess. Marigold had put on a happy face, but she knew she was growing bitter and resentful, having invested a lot of time in cultivating a working relationship with LB, enduring much ridicule from the men behind her back. Everybody wanted to fuck with her, but nobody wanted to fuck her. Thus tonight, they had only had a small celebration, just the two of them, not at home, as she had, would have liked. Her parent, her parent desired the publicity, and she had, gorged, she had ordered Rex to drive them to Sunset Boulevard, where they had dinner at Macumbo. She liked the club all right. The Latin, Amer Latin American themed design was tacky as fuck, but the food was some of the best. And she was famished and she wanted the steak so badly. But that was not what her mother had 
being mindful of her, telling her that she needed to stay thin and that the small waist made her breasts and ass stand out more. And there were girls who wanted what she, what was handed to her on a silver platter. After per, as per her mother's order, what got handed to her was half a grapefruit that wasn't anything to write home about and even less worthy of being referred to as supreme. Unless the lobster cocktail cardinal was, only that it was for her mother to stuff her face with. The situation didn't improve once the entries arrived, the beast, the, the beast masking as her parent had ordered. They, they could have asked for a chilibrate grill for gay for two, and she would have gladly settled for the lobster tamidor Prince de Morocco. But what she was settled with were grilled lamb chops with veggie sons potatoes like she was a fucking kid. Naturally, Marigold happily and noisily gormandized the entire finger-thick New York sirloin steak until she was gorged with so much protein and vitamin B to last her a lifetime. When she protested, Marigold looked up from her plate and, and lifting a hand with the fork clutched tightly, she pointed to a famous child of a Chris sitting across from the, uh, uh, sitting with her handless, signing autographs in between showing guns and hearts of celery. Watch your weight. There's your competition, she said, she said binging on Cooks as a parody. She could have murdered Marigold, but, what she, but she felt sorry for her. She was elated that her parent had chased down all the good food with dry martini macumbo, which had put her out of commission. She had finally, she had finagled the bigger bedroom, which connected to her dressing room on one side and her mother's room on the other. As she felt her smoke, she listened carefully, but there wasn't a sound throughout the entire house other than the snoring emanating from the opposite wall. Blowing Boris Karloff an air kiss, she quickly put on her canvas sneakers she wasn't allowed to wear in public. She opened the door leading to, wood, to the woodland gardens, stealthily stealing into the night. She had played plenty of nosy teenage detectives, detectives forced to act as a sidekick to the near and sufferable boy wonder Mickey, Mickey Rooney. No wonder below the waist, according to other gardeners, so creeping wasn't the initiative. Walking slowly, breathing in the cool air, she passed the swimming pool, its calm dark waters reflecting the unmoving treetops tree of the blooming cherry trees that provided some needed cover when she either raced with herself from one end of the pool to the other or sun -based. People in this hell of a town were offering good money for a shot of her in a bathing suit, but she wasn't a barrel patent. She wasn't a dime a dozen pinup queen. She was stunningly beautiful. She knew half of Hollywood's men wanted to fuck her, and many of the women too, not that she minded. She had tried both with different partners. It didn't make much, not much difference. She enjoyed fucking. That was all there was to it for now. She paused when she reached the guest cottage. Standing behind a pine tree, partially hiding her well proportioned frame, she peered across the darkness at the brightly lit living room that was like a sound stage without any bothersome drapes drawn over the paint windows. Shirtless, Clad in the pants of the suit he had worn in the car, Red stood with the back to her, his powerful body outlined by the floor lamp in the room. His other body was ripped. He had more muscle than she knew existed, and a round, and a round scar marked the tall skin above his right shoulder blade. It had to be from a bullet. Two weeks ago, when Marigold was still negotiating, negotiating, negotiating a new contract, a fellow actor approached her. She knew he and Bell were born the same year, 1960, to be precise, but that was where all similarities ended. Since making his film debut in the crime genre of the Paramount Pictures in 1946, starring alongside Barbara Stanwyck, his star had been on the rise. There was talk around town that he was thinking about starting up a production chamber. He was also dangerously handsome, had gotten divorced recently. She didn't know what to expect when she showed up by herself at his at his big suite at the Chateau, Chateau Marmont on Sunset Boulevard. Entering the suite, she found him sitting in an armchair in a semi dark room. The derbs behind her pulled over the windows during the daytime. He was wearing the same brown suit, white shirt, and red tie he had been photographed in by David Seymour, a Polish wartime photo journalist earning big bucks in Hollywood now making rain actors look even better. Like in his headshot in life, the star's famous chin dimple seemingly contained pool of black water, an effect of the afternoon sun peeking into the room despite the drawn curtains. I like what you're wearing, he stated calmly, his cold blue gaze flicking up and down. Lowering her gaze, she spied a riding crop he was, the riding crop he was holding in one hand. 
Then she noticed the shiny black boots standing next to his chair, but they weren't the, the right size for a man. They were for her. I want you to undress, do it slowly, and I want you to put the boots on. I'm going to rape you, and then I'm going to whip you. I might do it the other way around. Honestly, I haven't decided yet. Yes, you will do that, and I can't stop you, she told him without missing a beat. But you know, I have settled on you afterward. I've got this friend in Hollywood who's like a big brother. We tell each other everything. So my friend might want to give you a talking to, my friend Ronald. It was only a white lie, the part about telling somebody anything. But he was friends with Ronald, a decent actor. He had served as the president of the Screen Actors Guild for the last couple of years since Gene Kelly had nominated him for the job. He was also a close personal friend of G. Edgar Hoover, which meant he fed the malevolent toad and rumored closet crossdresser the names of actors who had gotten the roles he auditioned for, denouncing any such unfortunate individuals as either commie infiltrators or sexual deviants, whatever worked best with the script G. Edgar was writing for a program called This Is Your FBI, also known as Your Life Is Fucked, the shadow of the Hollywood 10 Bernie Marsh. The flicker in the eyes of the dimple chin would be rapist was unmissable. Get out, he barked. She did get out. But five minutes later, she returned to the suite, telling him to open up. It was either that or Red would break down the door. One look at his face revealed that he was very early to do it. She had told him what had happened. Then, turning in the driver's seat to face her, Red had asked her what she intended to do about it. She had shot him a hard grin. She knew if she didn't stop it right there, the actor would simply go to one of her colleagues, any one of those girls who were told to watch their weight. Red had the pick on the floor in under a minute. Sure, he was in shape, but Red was a boxer and he had kicked ass for the mafia. He didn't break the actor's nose or jaw, but he did a lot of damage. He had gotten violent quickly. The actor would later press, tell the press that defending the girl, he had taken on five coons. Smiling, she pulled her skirt up and her panties down to her knees. Standing right legged over this asshole, she, she assumed a squatting position, bringing a pussy and ass close to his cracked visage. Open up, she ordered him, then shooting a stream of bomb kiss into his bloodied mouth. Red moved away from the window and she glimpsed the, she glimpsed the woman who lounged on the sofa, holding a thin, thin stem cocktail glass, a cigarette burning between her red lipstick lips, thick curls grazing her temples. She was Antonella Thorne, that's why, an Italian woman who was rumored ties to the mob. She was also two years older than her husband, which she found strange, even though Antonella, who went by Tony, was a cool, tough chick. From all she could tell, he seemed to be in love with her, even though she, she had a hard time putting her drink down. The relationships were fascinating. Peer, peering at them through the paint glass, Ellen imagined how they made love. It had to be like animals fucking. Then turning left, she slinked to the past, leading through the whispering pines up the hill. Walking up the drive, passing the flowering, flo flowering cherry trees, she paused to peer into the lush green canyon, illuminating by, illuminated by the lights of Beverly Hills and Bel Air. The Schalzler listened to what sounded like the mating song of the coyotes calling for their lovers. Ellen approached the French country's dimension, near identical to the house she had just left, referred to as, as the twin house. The domicile she was looking at, towering over the other residents, like an eerily white specter, was simply known by its address, Cielo Drive, 10,050. This was the other thing that had happened. When she and her mother had moved into the house at Cielo Drive 10,048, both estates were owned by an elderly, older, older gentleman named Dr. Hartley and his wife. The Hartleys lived in the house that sat on the separate plateau above the twin house, which they rented out to rich folks in the movie colony. Then, late last year, the pair took a cruise trip around the island nations in the Caribbean. During the stay in Haiti, the Hartleys befriended a young couple, the husband being a medical doctor as well. As it turned out, Dr. Mosto, Mosto had worked at a hospital in Paris, only for him to up and leave his home country of France with his elegant wife and infant son, when the opportunity, opportunity presented itself for him to run a private thing sponsored by the Haitian government. But presently, Haiti, Haiti had descended into turmoil, burning through several presidents in the last years. So Dr. Mosto was looking for a way out for his family before the situation became untenable. Learning about this, the Hartleys told the Moscow's 
that they had been thinking about selling their two country style houses to move to Florida for a change of pace. Since Dr. Mosto's wife was the heir of a wealthy French family, a deal was quickly struck. The Mostos bought the houses and relocated to the United States. Marigold and she got, got to know them when they introduced themselves. Their son Francoise was three years younger than she. The French boy was an ugly child with big eyes, not too bright either, but harmless. She wasn't so sure if the same was true about the men who resided in the spare bedroom of the Mosto residence. Right now, the lamp in his lodging was only was the only light source illuminating the path in front of the 19th century style house leading past the swimming pool with its dark water. Her heart tightened and she instinctively held her breath when she saw him peering, stepping to the window across from her, his emaciated frame backlit and silhouetted. Other than the pine trees, there wasn't a place for her to hide without him noticing her. Thus, she remained in the same spot, not making a move, not breathing while he cast a telescoping gaze out of the paint window. Standing this close, she sensed the bad vibe radiating, radiating off him. The driver of the family was only five years her senior. Still, she couldn't miss the word drifter, with cross a wit large across his pasty white forehead. She knew that with this guy, evil was going on, not the type of mojo, perfect director, or dimple face sadist ever envisioned. She exhaled as he backed away from the window and no additional lights came on, which meant he hadn't seen her. Fucking asshole, she thought. And then she resumed her stride, and soon she heard the kind of music her mother hated. But then what did Marigold know, who had so little taste? Those Eames chairs in the dining, in in the dining room, paid for with the money she made acting. Those were an investment. Ellen knew the tune she was able to pick up before she reached the door of the guest cottage at Sierra Drive 10,050. It was called Dick. It was the second track of the first album by a jazz trumpet player named Mike Davis. The record was the new sounds, and the talent musician was black, which was why this was forbidden music in Marigold's mind. As for the woman she spied through the window, her eyes in trance, a wine glass in one hand, a smoke in the other, a vigilant parent dismissively referred to her only as the Asian woman. Ellen didn't know why 20, 20 year old um, Francis. While a 12-year-old, Francois Monstor would should still need a nanny, but she was sure that he did. Otherwise, the French doctor and his wife might not have asked the young woman to settle with them in the US. It was apparent that she came from an academic background, but given the political situation, working for a wealthy white family, then leaving her home with them, seemed a much better, a much safer bet than staying behind to see one dictator ousted by a military coup after the next. Even though Cecile Freeman was eight years older than she, they had become best friends fast, obviously on the QT, Q, QT and hush hush. When she stepped into the pet, Cecile lived and ran free as part of the remuneration package like Red did in the guest cottage at the twin house, she could immediately tell that they were kindred spirits. Glancing at her sleek black hair, cut short but not too short, and her ebony skin, it was more for her. Cecile made her horn and a sensation was separated. Entering the 2,000 square foot abode, the first thing we spied was the poster for Reefa Magnus displayed on one of the walls in the spacious living room. The imaginative one sheet pulled you in with its fire engine color scheme and double tagline that went for it. The sweet pill that makes life better. Women cry for it, men die for it. There was also a photo on the poster depicting a square looking show, lighting the stick, an attractive high cheek woman in a glittery dress seductively dangled between her lips. The irony was lost on her. Her friend wasn't only smoking tobacco, as she could tell from the sharp scent wafting toward her as if the smoke wanted to connect them. There was no need for the tall woman to hide her habit either, since according to Cecile, her employers were proponents of smoking weed for me medical and recreational purposes. Smiling, she gazed at the beautiful woman who swayed her hips to the smooth, restless sound of Miles Davis trumpet. Then she cast her eyes about the room. What she spied was a print of one of Max Ernst Riddle's paintings and pics of Humphrey Bogart and Henry Dickinson. The, late, the letter reminding her of a poem she quite liked called One Need Not Be a Chamber to be Haunted. The room also featured several built-in shelves, with books, and other reading materials. Kerouac's, Kerouac's The Town in the City and Bradbury's Arkham House Short Story Collection, Dark Carnival, were among Cecile's favorite titles. Other shelves had record collections held her record collection, ranging from the works of Robert Sati and Igor Stavinsky to Chet Baker and Davis. Cecile played the bongo drums and was quite good at it. 
other furniture, including an old sofa and a round table adorned with green with a green candle and an empty wine bottle. Ellen also spoke also spied an open wine bottle and an unused and an unused glass and an unused glass in a mesh tray. What she glimpsed as well were relics and artifacts from Cecilia's home, voodoo dolls and gas masks. Wanna to take a toke? So he offered, extending her arm. Yes, but not like this, and replied, smiling to a friend, who was clad in a sleeve like black top, black carpet pants, and black carpet pants. She also wore black ballerinas, and she smelled amazing. And the closer, and she and the beautiful black woman locked eyes. They embraced, and when they kissed, she pushed the Mariana smoke together with her tongue into her mouth and all cavity. Sucking the sweet, pungent, tasting fume into her lungs, Ellen felt a bit dizzy, but in a good way. Could not read, Caramia, Cecile said when they eventually came up for air. All our lives, and concurred, flashing her never smiled at those men insane. They made love on the floor. Afterwards, she undressed, Cecile shot her an inquisitive glance. You look like a red cat, or like you're plotting the crown of the century, the accent was sweet. No, she wouldn't whine about her life to a woman who had to babysit a spoiled bread while earning a fraction of what MGM was willing to pay her since she was a pretty white girl. And she knew how to say lines right as typed when they weren't completely shit faced and they got this notion that they had any clue how a real girl talked. On second thought, nobody was interested in hearing her talk like a real girl. Movie girls had enough reality in their lives to ever want that at the movies. It's nothing, she said. Oh, yeah, he signed the new contract this morning, she blurted it out. Oh, that was today? I can tell that it doesn't make you happy. I'm not supposed to be happy, Ellen said, glancing up at her lover while she lay on her back, cursing herself for saying exactly what she had just told herself she wouldn't say. Everybody deserves to be, deserves to be happy. I wish I could pray. I'm sure, he, I'm sure he doesn't listen, she paused. I know you do. You pray to your God. No, I don't. My God isn't, isn't like your God. When he isn't, doesn't involve herself with human affairs. But you told me you were a member of voodoo. Whom do you pray to? I've made a lifetime commitment to serving the Iva, who are our saints, angels, you might call them. So you talk to the Iva when you, when you do what you do, I mean, when you do your rituals and you pray? No, Cecile said as she got up. I pray to Papa Lekba, who in turn will speak to the Iva on my behalf. That is, if he likes what I have to say or what I ask for in my prayers. She walked across the room to pick, to pick up her smoke, to pick up her smokes from the table with the two bottles of wine, one full, the other sealed with a green candle. Striking a match, the yellow flame illuminated her face briefly. She was sweaty, they both were. It sounds like an awfully convoluted, convoluted plot, Aaron surmised, getting up on her knees. You speaking to an errand boy for him to talk to the dancer's help instead of praying to your God, she was crossing herself from Sudan when she had finished her sentence. Fuck, that sounded wrong. I'm sorry. No offense taken, Karamia, Cecile said, taking a puff into her smoke, inhaling and slowly exhaling. I must come across like an insensitive and cultural idiot, okay? In my defense, I'm only an actress. You're also, also a child, Cecile said, pointing her eyes at her. I could end up in jail or worse. Nobody will ever know. And Aaron got up and stepped to the table, taking the cigarette from her hand. I was an onsi when I pledged myself to the Iva and the Iva possessed me. I'm a priestess now. What do you mean? She asked, taking a deep drag on the cigarette, wishing it was a roach. As a bundle, I can help a person send a prayer to Bonnie, but there is a condition. Is there always? Um, one of exhaling, exhaling slowly, sounding wise beyond her ears. You need to understand something, Cecil began, pulling on the cigarette, on the cigarette she'd taken from her mother's fingers. Even though Bonnie is the name that's derived from the French for good God, Bonnie isn't anything like a Christian God. Bonnie, the Godhead, is the source of absolute power and safeguards the universal orders. I've told you she doesn't involve herself in the affairs of men. But you may petition her with your plea if you're prepared to make a sacrifice. The balance must be maintained. I want to be free to make my own decisions. I'm prepared to pay any price it involves. Be careful what you ask for, Ellen. You might not like what you will be asked, what will be asked of you in return, she stated, handing the girl the cigarette who took quick puffs at it. As I've told you, Bonnet or Bonnet, as she's also known, as she's also known, is not like your God. We do not believe in God and the devil. Bonnet is both. Cecile, you can't scare me, my love, Ellen said, leaning over the table to kill the cigarette. You're curious, aren't you? You're serious, aren't you? Yes. I'm so sick of 
I'm so sick and tired of men trying to rape me, of men telling me what, what to say and do. I want to be myself for a change. I didn't even know if I've ever been myself. Okay, I'm, you see what said, turning away from the table. If you step through a door that seemed to have been knocked, but then wasn't. Whatever happens, please remember one thing. All our lives, she repeated like she truly meant it, unexpectedly struck by a certain sadness. Tonight, here, now, it was the end of something. She sensed it in the electricity in the air and the lingering leaf for smoke. She regarded the one sheet, then darted her eyes back to the door. Step into my own room, my heart, so she would say once she opened the door, and Elm did exactly that. <coughs> you can come back on, I'm done. You need sound. Oh, that was a bit of a technology foul there. Hang on a second. I was adding Reese to the stream as well. Oh, Reese. Hello, Reese. Hey. 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 Hi, Reese. Hello, Reese. I'm just oh. reading your comments. What the noise? What's going on here? Oh. That was Reese. I'm Reece just turning your sound off. I'm just turning long. your sound off, Reese, because you sound like you're taking off in an aeroplane. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a moment to sort yourself out. It's all right. You can stay on the stream if you like, but I'll keep Chris, you muted. That, that was amazing, Chris. That was incredible. You're you're yeah. from Bella Lugosi to the cost of movie production and how much a movie made in box office to like little weird teen kids who are having feelings. I mean, you were all over the place, man. That was insane. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you for, for indulging me. That was a long chapter. But that's that was fabulous. Chapter. <laughs> this show, this show is all about celebrating authors, and so mm -hmm. we just want people to read. We want people to come on and talk okay. about their work. So, so we, we're we're totally thrilled. Yeah. And Absolutely. remember, the book the book is available on the link we posted. It's two ninety nine. It goes back to ten dollars tomorrow. Get it tonight and get the first book for free. Two ninety nine, but it goes back to ten dollars tomorrow. Okay, so yeah, everybody listening, go get and Chris's book right now. I tell you why it's ten dollars because my books are usually three hundred thousand words, which makes it nine hundred ninety pages. Oh, right, because of the printing. Yes. Yeah. 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 The link is on the scroll at the bottom of the screen, in case anyone. Oh, wow. is. There it is. There it is. Thank you very much. It's been on, it's been on the whole Thank time you you've been much. reading. Oh, yeah, no, you're welcome. Just, just for the record, this is not this is not a reef for smoke. This is just a cigarette. Well, that's boring. <laughs> I know, oh. but, I'm, but I'm, I'm drinking Bailey. I'm drinking Bailey's. I put thrown to gin for later. Bailey's is quite tasty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm more of a dark rum and coke girl myself, but um, yeah, Bailey's is alright. I, I, I think I missed. Drink. I think I missed up the, the the food. You need to read this because I researched the food. It's it's really this restaurant really existed, and the menu is really from this time period. And I really went through this menu, and I really wanted everything to be period original. That's awesome. That's really nope. cool. That's really uh, we, cool. We've talked about the way that we research stuff like that for our books mm -hmm. in the past on the show. So yeah, that's that's a, that's an awesome thing to share. That's great. Yeah. And just to talk about how how far, just to pick up the conversation that we left off, how far is Far. And, right, um, right. and this this will take a very very dark turn because um, Ellen when she she figures out what she, that what what she is that she is the Leviathan, she mm. also knows that in, in, contrary to her to her sister she can't swap bodies, so she can only transfer her consciousness into her child. There's the comment of the the um, Holly, the Hollywood River running delay nine months of the time. She needs a child, and guess how she gets a child. She forces and triggers her driver into basically sexually assaulting her. And she says, well, now I got what I wanted. And then she kills basically everybody and has everybody killed. And throughout the story, we meet a guy who murders a family very in the 60s. And he's introduced as a, as a tattooed man. His face and his hands are completely tattooed. And he's the other driver who Aaron curses out and then becomes the servant. And when we meet him as the tattooed man, we don't know who he is. But then when we read this, we have no idea that this driver who turns up in the next chapters eventually will become the tattooed man. Ah. Uh. <laughs> That's a little twist and turns. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. And, oh, and, 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 
and there's there's so much stuff going on and and uh, I'm, I hope I don't make anybody uncomfortable but there's this this family this the two men kills he leaves the 10 year old boy alive and this 10 year old boy is then interviewed by the police who says well basically um, there was your brother was killed and his girlfriend was killed um, was your was the girlfriend of your brother seeing somebody else was your brother involved in this and then there's a, a woman who comes in and she's oh I'm a child psychiatrist I need to take this boy and they drive to this estate it's very X Men like and this is this very this very rich French couple who escaped the Holocaust and they're devil hunters and they take this ten year old boy who's by the way black and then they say well basically do you want revenge here's a gun you know you will kill for us wow and this ten year old boy understands immediately they will take advantage of him. They are not acting out of the kindness of their own heart. Right. And he says, well, basically, I don't want you to use my name anymore. I'm now the American. And he says, I'm just holding my name from these people. That's a really interesting. Um, I love how your story has so many twists and turns in it. Yeah. Um, you know, like as soon as you start thinking it's going to be one thing, it, it actually isn't that. It's something completely different. No, so it's something mm -hmm. that you don't expect. It's really awesome yeah, because you, you, sometimes I mean, can be a little bit predictable. Yeah, you basically what I liked, what I set out to, to do in the beginning was uh, to look at all these tropes of of horror stories and and fantasy stories and say how can I twist them, how can I turn them, and how can I lead the, the, the readers into traps where they say, oh, I know the story, this is going this way, and then all of a sudden all these characters. Are completely not these trope characters anymore. We start with a boy whose parents are murdered, also in the first book, and then we oh, this is the the, the mentor from Star Wars, the old mentor who adopts the boy who's now an orphan, but this guy is an absolute asshole. And it's basically not this idea of this nice Obi Wan Kenobi guy, but this is this guy who says, well, basically now I have another child soldier. And this is this this whole idea: what would be Star Wars like if it were real? Man. I, I think I think it's just fascinating. I think it's a really good way of writing as well when you're looking at tropes. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a predictability mm -hmm. in the story because sometimes mm -hmm. it provides a little bit of safety and comfort, doesn't it? But mm -hmm. um, when you've got gothic horror or thriller or something that is keeping you on the edge of your seat, um, you kind of want to have those twists and turns and the unexpected Absolutely. things going on because it makes you go, what, what's going to happen next? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And also you can also play a little bit with this with maybe the expectations of, of, of readers and um, to, to set up little mystery boxes. For example, when you talked about that um, Ellen later has this, this theme park, this shoot, which is basically Disney's Disneyland. And many years later, there's my character who has owned now owns a movie, uh, a movie production company. She wants to buy this failing studio. And she visits this park, and this park is completely run down. There are cats walking around. We see cats all around, and she immediately senses there's something wrong with this theme park. And what had what happened was basically there was a, there was an accident at this park, a very gruesome accident. And this was how the, the devil tricked her sister. Where basically she said, "I can make it all go away because otherwise the cats will haunt you, but you can never leave your body again." Mm. I love it. Adelis is there as, as bait for, because the Leviathan will not take this lying down, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. I think it's really interesting um, yeah. how you've kind of uh, woven that. Um, and you, you kind of, you've written it in such a way that you can see what's happening like in front of you. Um, but I can imagine that all three of us that are listening mm -hmm. have, have probably got our own different idea of what everything looks like mm -hmm. because there's just enough left out of the detail to make it vague enough for people to be able to create their own mm -hmm. understanding of what's going on yeah. whilst enough detail so that it's explicit in terms of what's happening and who's doing what and the actions that they're doing and things like that. So you can envision what's is happening in that way. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very clever. And by, by, pulling, by pulling from reality, you're giving us uh, mm -hmm. things that, that that we have as our own references. You, you mentioned Bela Lugosi, you mentioned these different things, and, and each of us 
if we know who Bela Lugosi is, that was a long time ago. You know, for those nerds who know, know these old nerdy actors, then we have this appreciation, and suddenly I pop into the the uh, Tim Burton movie of Ed Wood, where he actually yeah. comes in and does these old ass scenes before he fucking died in real life. Like, yeah, yeah. But it's and, awesome. and, and what I what I mentioned that that Bela Lugosi gave Boris Karloff dating tips on a radio program where they were interviewed. That really exists. You can go on, on YouTube and listen to this. And there's Bella Lugosi who thinks he's this handsome guy. And there's uh, Boris I Karloff. Know, I know. And, and, <laughs> the, and, the reason, and the reason why I picked Boris Karloff as, as, a, as a girl crush, Boris Karloff was Indian, or he was of Indian descent. And he hit this Indian heritage by putting on makeup. And so basically, there's the parallel where Alan says, well, basically, like Boris Karloff. He hit his necessity. I'm hiding my immortality behind the flesh mask of a human face. And there's a scene where she basically has her lover killed because she no longer fits her plan. And she puts a streak of blood from her lover all over her face. And and basically the driver, who is now her servant, says, well, are you bleeding? And she said, you know, I can't bleed. But then it must be the blood from you taking off your, your mask and showing your true face. And it's... <laughs> Getting like, uh, what's that serial killer who wore people's skin? Ed Gein. Oh, Ed Gein. Ed Gein. Ed Gein. You mean Ed Gein? Okay. Yes. And ironically, I have this um, this movie production company that's called Plainfield 57. And somebody asked me why is it called Plainfield 57? Plain Plainfield was the town where Ed Gein lived, and 57 was the year he was arrested. Ah. And and wow. Adele's, father, Adele's father made his first movie called Plainfield 57, so he named his company after his first movie. And since he's the biggest liar of Hollywood, he basically is not the story of Ed Gein, it's more Texas Chainsaw Massacre, because he says, well, basically, nobody's interested in some old guy who murdering old women. We want some hot teenagers in there. And that's right, his right. first movie. That's, that's, that's kind of interesting. And how we meet him in the third book is in the studio 54, and Adele's father, this movie producer. And he's standing next to Halston in the wall. And I love the scene where he says, well, basically, Halston, oh, you have all this fancy fashion. You need to be in a JC Penny. And he says, well, basically, uh, hell freezes over. Ah, we need ah, to do ah. this. And Halston, went to JC Penny. Goes to JC Penny, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I love these kinds of the way the, the future or the our our present gives us it gives me insight to play these characters mm -hmm. and uh, this is so wonderful. And yeah. I, it's, it's, really, it's like you were saying about yes. the recognizable tropes. You get you get these things that 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 we all know from, from cinema and TV and other other media but yeah. but the and and like Jules said, it is nice to have sometimes have those be predictable and whatever. But yeah. but we do. I think all of us here on the show we do celebrate when when there's a twist, when something's completely different than you expect, when when it's going along one trajectory and suddenly chaos comes in and knocks you off course. Yeah, I think that we all sort of it, it, embrace it, that. <laughs> in, my, in my reality, and it, it could really have been our reality, Horn, the Adele's father produced Star Wars. He produced the first Star Wars and he got all the money basically. And they, he's standing there with, with Andy Warhol and Halston Horn in, in, in Studio 54. It's the night when Bianca Jagger gets on a white horse and it's Bianca Jagger's birthday. And where you basically have this, this uh, Andy Warhol says, oh, I like this Mark Hamill guy on the post. And he says, oh, Mark Hamill doesn't look anything like this. But you know, I, I told George an important lie and he added all up. What is the lie? That there's good and evil. <laughs> That's good. That you can show us. <laughs> and this is this is this is so much fun. And there is also he, Horn is this wonderful nerdy character. He, he talks about a comic book that really exists from 1940, 1994. And in this comic That's book, my era. That's when I was reading comic books. What is it? it it's it's called. Uh, it's from nineteen ninety four uh, nineteen forty four. So it's from the war time. And it's about these these um, made up characters, Courage, Faith, who's of course a woman who looks very hot, Truth, and a couple of others, and they go up against Hitler. And in this comic, Hitler's goons kill Truth. Now, this is something you can milk. This is something you can completely <laughs> can milk. Yeah. Yep. You have, to have a guy who's a, who a proud liar and says, I'm the biggest liar in Hollywood, and they kill Truth. This is so wonderful. And maybe that was the lie too, he says. <laughs> 
isn't it interesting how history, events in history can inspire so much oh, yeah. variation? And, and, you know, there's been so many, if you think of just one event, that's been something that's been known throughout most of the world, like the Second World War. There's been so many books that have been written and films that have incorporated an aspect of that, but from a completely different point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and some mm -hmm. fantasy and some science yeah. fiction and some... Godzilla's a pretty yeah. good example of that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you've got... Um, was it, oh, there was a, a TV series that came from a book as well. Um, and... It was basically where Hitler won the war. And mm -hmm. so Hitler um, and Japan made a truce. Yeah, and the men in the high castle. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. It. Yeah, I mean, I could, yeah. I couldn't think of the name of the title of, of, of it. Um, yeah. And um, again, that's a, that's a really interesting kind of like alternate uh, sort of ending, um, which is interesting. Um, there's also a book by Jonas Jonasson, but I think you pronounce his name Jonas because it's um, mm -hmm. Swedish author, Jonas Jonasson. And um, he wrote The Hundred Year Old Man Who Climbed Out the Window and Disappeared. Mm -hmm. yeah, which, mm -hmm. if you, I don't know if you've read it or not, but it is actually, it's really good. And mm -hmm. it's like a tongue in cheek look at history. And it places this 100-year-old man on the day of his birthday who basically escapes from a geriatric home. And mm -hmm. he decides he just, just wants to explore. And it's his adventures. And he wears his slippers and he forgets things and he can't carry much. And um, <laughs> throughout the whole book, you have like flashback scenes to um, his life. And you get to see what he's done throughout his life. And each flashback is centered on an actual historical event. Um, and it's really interesting how the author has um, used an accurate historical event and then weaved it in so the protagonist has had something to do with it. <laughs> um, so, for example, he, um, he helped develop, he was really interested in explosives and got put in prison for it, um, and war broke out and um, he was released and he ended up um in russia um and helped develop the nuclear program there and ended up in america and helped develop the nuclear program there and worked with albert einstein and various other things and um yeah kind of charts his journey it's a good book i do recommend it <laughs> i love to do that to to melt these historical events around my fictional characters Mm. yeah it's a really clever way of doing it and so if you're because obviously that's what you're kind of doing that's a good book to use as an example now obviously the, the style of writing is slightly different it's not graphic <laughs> in the way that your one is um it's very light-hearted tongue-in-cheek just gentle mm. funny but it is a good book it's a good read i highly recommend yeah, absolutely. <laughs> i think they also turned it into a movie if i'm not mistaken it was it was but the movie mm -hmm. was rubbish it didn't oh, do the book oh. justice so, that's most, but that's most movies though. That that's yeah. most movies. They just... yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so Reese, you've just joined us. I feel like you need to introduce yourself properly and tell us about your writing. But then we need, we need to hear Jules's reading because she's got something yes. that she wants to read also. Yeah. So, Ooh, we got new uh, stuff. Let's do it. Let's it. <laughs> Go ahead, Reese. <laughs> Well, hello again, everybody. My name is Reese, a.k.a. Reese the Storyteller. I am a romance and uh, erotica author, um, <laughs> poet. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm working on right now. I'm like, I'm, like seriously, with, the, with the, the topic for today, I was so tickled because I'm like, there's so far. There, there's so far you can go in writing. Everybody's not going to be on the same vein with you. That's just the, you know, that's that's just the 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 point of it. You will find your audience. I actually had this same conversation with somebody yesterday, or maybe day before yesterday. Um, we were talking about that. It's like, well, I have to find my audience. I'm like, yeah, there's an audience for everybody, no matter what you write. It's just that sometimes we have to throw out disclaimers because we don't want people having issues with the things that they're reading. Uh, but yeah, overall, man, it's I'm going to push the envelope 
as far as I can push it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to do it. Yeah. Um, and your writing is very, um, it, it's very out there, isn't it? So it's first like, game. Oh. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> so what else you I'm out there made it sound like it would be crazy, but no, it is it, risque is probably risque. a very mild way yep. of putting it. <laughs> um, very mild. But it yeah, and it's interesting because you um have written in a completely different style to um what Adam and I have written in, which is mainly fantasy, mm -hmm. which is also Adam is more violent and his writing leans closer to what Chris has done. Uh, so, yeah, it's really cool how we've all got completely different writing styles. Uh, yeah. And, and actually, we've all, I think we've all written to where we feel our limits are. Actually, I don't know. Have we written to where our limits are? Do you feel like you've reached your limit? I don't know because just like we were talking about with, the, with, our, with our project we've been doing with the horror stories, that's going into another realm that I haven't really touched on. So mm. it I would it's not a struggle, but it's definitely different from you know from my normal writing. So it's it's been interesting. It's been an interesting ride. It has I pushed my limits yet. I'm 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 getting there, but I don't think I've pushed myself to where I would go, you know what? This is definitely not on no, not on this. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, just to reiterate, the story that you're talking about is going to be linked to our black screen stories. Um, series that we're going to be releasing at some point soon. So look out for that. It's all going to be horror stories to fall asleep to. Wow. <laughs> so that's, that's, a great title. that's a great title. I love this already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, we, uh, I think we're calling it the death tapes. So uh, yeah, watch this space. <laughs> uh, we'll be releasing those soon. Um, all right. Are you happy for me to do a little bit? Yes. Of yes, yes. Let's go. <laughs> okay. I'm going to be reading from book one of my uh, dark fantasy series. Um, it's called Of Thorns and Demons. And just very briefly, uh, Ray, who is the protagonist, she ended up getting caught up in a riot in the town centre. Mm. And um, she ended up getting captured while she was trying to save another child. She ended up getting captured by the guards. Um, so the bit I'm reading, it kind of straddles the very end of part one and goes into the beginning of part two um, but to save you from having to like keep up with past i'm just going to read it without reading the chapter titles um to try and sort of give it more fluidity um um okay so Pym, oh, shall I put myself on the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 before I start reading, hang on a second. <laughs> uh, there we go. If you meet yourselves as well. Okay, so uh, this is from uh, Of Thorns and Demons, and this is um, the middle of the book, basically. Peering through half closed eyes around the dank space surrounding me, I groaned. Oh, why had I woken? My eyes stung with each blink from dryness, forcing my way to sit on the rickety cot. I swung my cold feet to the ground, flinching as my toes touched the corners of the stone floor. A warm pink glow illuminated the bars that guarded the gap in the wall, casting a heavy bar-like shadow on the wall behind. Even the wall was a prisoner here. Pulling the thin blanket around my legs tighter, I drew them to my stomach wrapping my arms around them and stared at the pink as it transitioned into a pale yellow and moved down the wall to the floor. I was alone, alone and with no one else in the world who I kept, who, who I, no, sorry, I was alone, alone and with no one else in my world who I cared about. What was the point anymore? Deep sleep evaded me. Though I had almost managed to doze a little until the screaming shocked me into being awake again. Sleep deprivation was also making the memories of the last few days vivid and tangible. So real. I could almost reach out and grab the pale boy and pull him away from the soldier before he got killed. Food consisted of a meagre lump of bread, cheese and an apple with a mug of water. I'd refused to touch it for the first three nights. But thirst and hunger soon dominated every thought, so against my better judgment, I had eaten it like an animal. Animal pretty much described how they managed toileting too, hence the bucket. The thing was that I didn't care any more about that. 
It was what he did that made all else seem negligible. My wrist throbbed madly in protest at the movement from his last visit and with a continued self-hatred that fogged my mind. Resting my wrist against the wall, I found the cold stone eased the pain and gave me welcome respite for a few moments at least. Pushing myself up so I was sitting, my head spun and I lowered my feet over the side of the cot and steadied myself again. Just as my foot contacted the stone floor, there was a slight click and creak from the door. Gasping, I withdrew my feet from the floor and brought my knees back to my chest again. My stomach dropped. He was back. The dark figure strode towards me, pressing a heavy hand against my chest and flattened me against the wall. I struggled and flailed against him, but he held me too powerfully and it was hard to breathe. He said nothing, but just stared at me with those sickly pumpkin-coloured eyes that glowed in the dark. I lurched, kicking my legs, and tried to call out, but the soldier responded by putting both hands around my throat and squeezing hard, making any sound from me impossible. As the air left my lungs, I thrashed as hard as I could, but his thumbs pressed hard onto my larynx and my screams fizzled into rasps. My hands scratched and scraped against the hands wrapped around my throat as shadows shrouded my vision. My strength melted from my arms and legs, and they dropped to my side. His eyes were narrow, haunting, and never left mine as I welcomed unconsciousness. He moved his hands from my neck and clasped my collar. The release lifted the darkness that was enveloping me, but it was short-lived as he threw me to the floor, winding me. On my knees, I scrambled to a crawl away from him as adrenaline cursed through my body. He grabbed my ankle and I kicked back toward his head with my other foot and then he grabbed hold of both ankles and yanked them so hard towards him I fell onto my head and yelped in pain. I tried to grab onto even the smallest thing to hold onto to pull me away from him but my fingers just scraped the stone floor. I couldn't fight him anymore. My strength was gone and I had nowhere to go. He took delight in my misery and my pathetic attempts to get away. Heart pounding, head throbbing and exhausted, I lay frozen to the floor as a wave of vertigo made the room spin and the pain in my head increased. The last thing I felt before I blacked out was the searing pain that overwhelmed me as he pinned me down. Time stood still and froze, forever locked in that first moment of grief and torture. Unable to fight its way from at, out from the darkness that seeped into my, every part of my being, the days and nights blended into total emptiness and neither registered. The bird song and rain sounded hollow and the pain numbed my body until nothing mattered. The days were the same. Some food and water, my bucket emptied and returned. The rest of the daytime, the disembodied sounds of, in of your repressed inmates floated through the corridors and seeped into my cell. Some were louder than others. Some cried and others pleaded as I had done. None were real. All were in my head. All the while each day passed, I waited. I waited for my tormentor to return as he had done as the cell turned into a dark hole that sucked the life from my soul and I hoped for my end. This was it. Everything was inconsequential now. The gods ignored my plea each time he would open my cell door as I awoke semi-conscious from it every time. As the sun dipped, casting long shadows on the walls, the cells lost its soft, muted tone. The eeriness and dank cold blurred the edges of stones into one another. The abyss meant that the pain would begin anew. My body shook as the oppressive encounter loomed ever closer, casting images and smells that flashed into my vision and purged my odour onto my nose. It stirred a cold sweat that drenched my body and made my teeth chatter from the mix of apprehension and adrenaline. When the final glow of light was depleted, the cell door would creak, o creak open and he would return. He'd always return. Every night. The green shrub had grown through my window and had turned a gorgeous deep red from the autumn. It brought a soft pang of nostalgia for the cottage, for Pa and my home. How wonderful I'd thought the whole world was then. The love from Pa, Audrey, Elias, Nayli. But their faces were fading now. 
even their names held no draw. If I saw any of them again, would they know who I was? Would I recognise them? I miss sitting by the window at home with the blazing fire crackling in the hearth and listening to and talking with Pa and toasting chestnuts. Whilst outside, wild as ever, Naily ran through the herb garden, making her fingers smell of all the different plants as she ran her fingers through each one. Naily, I failed you. I'm sorry. So, so very sorry. So I'm going to stop it there and I'm going to bring you back to the chat. Hang on. Let me, uh, 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 how do I do this? One second. Oh, yay. <laughs> yay. <laughs> yay. Right. I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> so I, if just a short bit, but um, it was quite a hard, quite a hard bit to write in the book, I think. Um, and um, it's quite difficult for me to um, convey enough, but hold back enough at the mm -hmm. same time. Um, because I didn't want it to be graphic in, in that set. I didn't want to have like every single description mm -hmm. um, because I think you don't need to with scenes like that necessarily. I think it obviously depends on like the style of the book, but um, I don't know. What did you guys think? I thought you had a great balance. Yeah, I think it was very traumatic. And I think that 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 people who have gone through something uh, remotely similar will uh, relate to it and, and see, the, see the similarities to their own lives. But I think that you did it delicately enough that mm -hmm. most readers could appreciate their way through it and, and realize what's happening and that Ray is going to grow from it. You know, and it's it's she's going to survive it. You know, it's not mm -hmm. it's like the bleak end of her. And I think we all the reader knows that at that point in the story. Yeah, yeah. She is she, her darkest period. Um, and I did I I really did have to battle with um, how far am I going to break her? Um, it what's going to be the breaking point for her? Is there going to be a breaking point? And I had to make the decision about whether I was going to even keep the scene in because um, it was more like, is it necessary that she experiences that? But what I wanted to do is to use that as a tool to show that you can survive. You can grow from it. Like you said, you can find a way. Um, it just takes time and lots of healing and stuff. And so it kind of it lends itself to her character where she spends the rest of book two and um book three with lots of flashbacks um but not really flashbacks that she ever talks about she never mentions them to anyone she just has them and so it becomes a real central point of the book um and the whole series really is centered on uh, recovery from trauma and and how that happens and how a person may do it obviously it's not really realistic to go out and fight monsters because we don't have Amarox and <laughs> and um, manticores and and various other uh, mythical beasts roam in the land unless they're hiding <laughs> or they're invisible. Um, but I wanted it to be a point where she reaches her lowest point, but it's at that lowest point where there's a spark of hope, and it's almost like she just about gives up, and that spark occurs, and it's not a spark that she has any control over. But it's a spark nonetheless, and that's what actually gets her to have the strength to carry on. Because she reaches a point where she's just like, she literally just wants to die. Mm. She, she doesn't see the point in living. She doesn't understand why they're keeping her alive. They don't get why they're feeding her. They don't. She doesn't understand any of it. She thinks she's alone. She doesn't understand that the voices are actually real. Um, and so she's she's in this this point of her life. And she's young still. She's like, what, 16? She's coming on 17. So she's, you know, she's really dealing with, she's de dealt with a lot of loss in her life as well. Um, you know, it's the start of war. We've got child soldiers being, you know, created. Um, and so she's she's very much at this point where she, um, she hates herself, um, but not enough to actually do anything about it. She just wants to lie on the, cot and just wither away into nothingness but her her instinct to keep going is too strong which is why she eats and drinks 
Um, and she's glad she does, sort of. Um, but yeah, the, the spark, I wanted to convey how important relationships are um, and the links that we form with people and how important they, they can be with each other and, and how they see us through the darkest periods in our lives. And so the thing that sees her through is the relationship she has with her sister a until later on in some of the books, which I'm going to leave it there as a little bit of a cliffhanger. But, um, yeah, she, um, for now, her driving point is her sister. Um, and, yeah, that is the spark. So, yeah. <laughs> Sounded very believable to me. It's believable. That's mm -hmm. good to hear. Because I, I wanted, whilst it is fantasy, there's, like I said, there's monsters, there's um, a form of magic which is closer to Jedi, like the Jedi skills, than it is to like actual magic. Um, but it comes across as magic. Um, there's um, a, a species, a native species called the Okarian, who are like pretty orcs <laughs> who live there. Um, so I've kind of done lots of fantasy stuff um but i've tried to add realism to it as well so that it's you know more grounded like the main character she is mixed race um potential love interest is an orcarian um potential love in uh, who's female and another potential love interest is male and he's um he's got he's he's like how can i describe him have any of you seen twilight the first one <laughs> Reese looks so disappointed with herself. She's like, yeah. Yeah. Not gonna lie. <laughs> the first one was bad. They got better as they went along. That's oh, okay. what I'm say. <laughs> okay. I, I thought I think the opposite, but that's fair enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Jacob. Okay. So well, at least he, the acting got better. I don't know about the storyline. Uh -huh. The acting yeah, got, better. <laughs> got better. Yeah, I, I think the storyline went a bit like, whoa, okay. Um, but yeah, the uh, so J uh, Raven looks very much like Jacob, but slightly darker skinned. Um, so yeah, um, I've tried to stay away from the white hero tropes um, because I think that that's a bit boring. <laughs> um, we've we've seen white heroes all the time in, in fantasy stories and straight heroes and heroes that, you know, spend all time in their woods and never go for shit anywhere and stuff like that. You know what I mean? let's, <laughs> let's expand that a little bit. We've seen white men in every role. I'm tired yeah, of seeing exactly. white men in every it's single so role. Ready and, for and, and, anybody and, and, else. Wouldn't, wouldn't you know, wouldn't yeah. you know, I find this so amazing, I find this so amazing. I had this discussion and they, they had the, the trailer for the, the Flash movie. And then somebody said, well, basically, now they have Supergirl. It needs to be Superman. And the comic story was Superman. Why is no Supergirl? I said, why wouldn't there be a girl? It's otherwise a sausage face. No, but it was different in the comic books. It needs to be Supergirl. No. Why? <laughs> it's like the Little Mermaid. That the whole why? Little Mermaid passed by a, a girl who, um, you know, a black girl, and oh young woman I, I don't know exactly how old she is young adult and you know and there's so many people in uproar about this black mermaid and she's like you do realize mermaids don't exist <laughs> it's a fantasy they story can be whatever <laughs> color you want them to be they can be aquamarine nobody cares the point is no. it's a story and it's a different actress That's it. who cares i know i mean they're obviously there yeah i mean there's obviously some stories like mulan you know it, it, that's kind of based off an actual like story an actual real right. life thing so you can't really change the race or, or of that main character in that sense because that's i mean it's it's loosely based um but it, you know stories like uh, the little mermaid or uh, you know any of the superhero ones there was absolutely no reason at all why in it like like uh Bond, James Bond as well. They were going to cast a black female actress to play in yeah. James Bond. And people were like, who can't have that? James Bond is white and male. And it's just like, who cares? <laughs> Does it matter? There was, some, there was even somebody on Twitter who said, no, no, no. I saw his gravestone and he was of Scottish origin. You realize he's a fictional character, right? But yeah. You know, <laughs> just... That's it. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I've tried to stay away from those kind of, um, you know, tropes. So like my main character, she is, she looks uh, mixed race um, and her sister is 
you know, th there's lots of remarks about her massive, like big massive curls that she has, and um, she's she's darker skinned than Ray is, and um, yeah, I just wanted to have characters that are look like different. real life. Diverse, like, yeah, real diverse. Life diverse. <laughs> yeah, and I, and, and, I, and, and I always and I always like when 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 white men say yeah but race shouldn't matter it should just be there and i i, I took this to heart when i introduced a character in my third book who becomes very important and she when we meet her she's a 13 year old girl perhaps out in a drugstore and this is a very this is a scene that is very much based on a real life story of of a boy who was abducted by, by john Wayne gacy only here it's more working a color type and it's a girl that gets snatched her friend and when we learn about this this girl he's, she's 13 and she is only one class below her friend who's 17. and the, the girl and the counter is this typical blonde um, she's doing the crossword puzzle and she asks the, this, this character max um i have this this year what's the oldest living being it starts with an s and she says sequoia oh, what does that mean that's a trick and you don't need to know more who was the smartest in the room and then she walks to the drugstore and she has to put in packages and so on and so on she has to sort in the shelves and then at the end of the end in 1963 when the story so when this chapter starts and in the smallest corner of the drugstore she sees all these these posters for beauty products in the smallest corner of the drugstore she finds beauty products for black people and then the camera turns and we know she's black now I, in my local store, I, I sent a formal email, like formal complaint to the, the manager of um, the local uh, superstore that we have near to us, because in the beauty section where you've got like makeup and sanitary towels and deodorant and, you know, all this kind of stuff and, you know, all this, the, the perfume, you know, you know, you know, you know, the area, Reese. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, um, I'm not saying you guys don't go there, but it's like it, you probably don't go there for sanitary towels. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> and um, they had this massive area full of all this stuff and this one single stand with products for black people, like specifically aimed at black people. And that's fine. Yeah. Awesome that they've got stuff there that is specifically for their skin type and their hair and everything. And um, right next to it is the till, which then obviously has to be manned with a big lock safe. And I'm like, hmm, that's an interesting placement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why it's right next to that particular area? Anyway, mm -hmm. soon after my complaint went in, they uh, got rid of the till. <laughs> and I also, I also don't, 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 don't like books that that don't take into account a certain this this balance of power and, and the certain structure. Because this girl who's thirteen who works in this drugstore, she got a little bit confused because her boss, who was middle aged, he said something to her. Like, and she's thinking about this. And what he said was basically, you're developing nicely. Oh, Isn't that the grossest no. thing you will ever hear? Yeah. And then yeah. there's this routine where every every evening he, he eats uh, in the diner when he deposits the money from the from the register, he eats a, a chart chart grilled steak that's pinned on the inside. As as a woman, and I don't know, Reese may agree with this or not, uh, most women can relate to that probably go back five more years and that's normally when male attention starts becoming obvious you know remarks about you know mm -hmm. breast size and developing and all that kind of stuff when you're five six seven the eight creepy old men on the corner mm -hmm. when you're trying to go home yeah school. Mm -hmm. yeah it's just yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 So, are, you, yeah. are you all familiar with uh, the singer billy eilish yeah mm -hmm. yes Okay, so uh, you may have you may know the story that she uh, she was producing music her own music and people were like, why are you wearing all these bulky clothes? Why don't you dress like cute? Like you're a girl, you should be cute. And she was like, I'm taking my body out of the discussion. You're gonna have to listen to my music and enjoy my music. And I thought that was so inspiring. I wrote a character in my book who does the exact same thing. She's her this does the exact same thing too. Um, one of the reasons why she does she she wears her glasses, her sunglasses, that's one of her signature things, is because she wants you to focus on her music, not her body. 
Yeah. And it makes sense. Yeah. It makes perfect sense because what, what they're selling essentially these days is sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, they're not selling the, they're selling the image they're not selling the actual music because some of that stuff is complete trash oh <laughs> God. i can't even sing some of, some of the best-selling songs you're listening to and you're like that because they're flat on some of the notes and it's just like oh my god how did they even make money uh yeah absolutely but uh you know i, I know that men obviously have um their own issues but women do get um sexualized from a very young age and most women you'll meet have had um, that kind of experience from around five, six, seven, eight years old onwards. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely disgusting. But yeah, it's what we live with. Um, anyway, I am going to bring this to uh, uh, an end because I thought we can keep talking all night. Chris, it's been absolutely amazing having you. Um, yes, thank you, know, you Chris. I'm very happy yeah. to be here. It's a nice, nice group here. I'm always so fun. <laughs> <It's so wonderful. laughs> You're very welcome to join us again. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm just, I'm going to just put my uh, my website up on the screen just for a moment. So um, I, you if you are interested. Mm-hmm. Oh, you spelled the name wrong. I'll take that off then. <laughs> Don't, that's not Don't my website. That. That's not how she spells her name. Try again, round two. Round two. Here it comes. Oh, here it comes. Oh, there we go. Okay. We got that was really amazing, mm-hmm. clearly. Um, so head there if you're interested in um, you know, fo- like meeting me. I'm starting a members only section where you can uh watch some vlogs and get ready ready with me for the show um and um i'm putting up uh, the anthology for my book series from the book that i just read um and you can get access to all that for free so that's in the process that's in the works of being done so if you're interested um come and join and become a member and um once i have completed setting it up you will be um able to access all um all right there you go so i'm gonna say with that thank you so 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 much for coming chris it's been an absolute pleasure having you here um and i really really hope you come back and visit us again and thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank you so much thank you so much